So let me close looking at, um, well, two things. One is a tiny bit of the history, which is not my focus here, but I'll, I'll mention it, um, and focusing on the legacy of Cantor. And then I want to close with one uh, famous, again, application of essentially a diagonal idea that gets at how weird set theory can be. So I put together a list here of all the things that come from Cantor. Uh, when you look at any area of mathematics, there, there will sometimes be one person who um, is the strongest person in that area for a long period of time, who leads to a lot of the ideas, is too super famous. But there's, there's few areas that were as dominated um, as this, these ideas, set theory and infinities, by Cantor. Um, he really almost came up with a, a lot of it almost entirely on his own, which is really quite unusual. The, the solitary genius is not really what happens most of the time in mathematics, but this, this is somewhat of a counterexample. Um, set theory, which is now uh, the foundation of mathematics um, and also just a part and parcel of doing day-to-day -day mathematics. The idea of a one-to-one -one correspondence is a huge idea of and leads to other very similar ideas of when are two mathematical structures the same, even though they look different. Uh, the idea of cardinals and cardinal arithmetic. I didn't talk much about cardinal arithmetic, um, but you can define a kind of a funky arithmetic with cardinals, just like you can with ordinals. Um, the diagonalization trick is huge. Um, for We've seen a few instances of that, and it goes on in very, in very cool contexts. The continuum hypothesis, the idea of the question of okay, once you've introduced cardinals, which how do you how do you rank them and what um, where does the cardinality of the continuum of the, the real number line go? Um, the idea of a well-ordered set, which is if you want to make the ideas of ordinals that I'm I've been I was very very sketchily introducing. If you want to make those rigorous, um, it relies on the idea of a well-ordered set. Uh, of course, ordinals and ordinal arithmetic and the Cantor set. Um, this is not the whole list, but this, these are the, sort of the most fundamental ones that I could uh, think of. Um, quite, uh, quite a legacy. Um, and unfortunately for him, it was not a well-received legacy uh, uniform, universally um, at the start. Um, by the end of his life, the tide had really turned, and most people believed that this was the way, that, the way mathematics should proceed forward. But by then, unfortunately, he had had a lot of, a lot of mental problems, and he was um, in an institution. Um, let me just talk a tiny bit about the history, what led Cantor to this. Um, it came from a question about representing functions as sums of sine waves. And I'm probably I'm going to do a talk more about this in the summer, so it'll, it'll be up on YouTube eventually. But the quick version is that Fourier, um, French mathematician, 1807, came up with a, a radical new way to analyze the flow of heat by representing a temperature profile function, say in a rod, as a sum of sine waves. Now Euler and other people had had done this, had, had represented functions in this way before, but hadn't realized how general it could be and how it could be used, for example, in the theory of heat. Um, perhaps the, the reason they hadn't realized it is the objections, the many, many objections that people came up with to Fourier's idea right away. It, would re it was, again, sort of like Cantor's ideas, were received very negatively by the leading lights of the day. And it took 20 years for him to show that there was any validity to it at all. Um, even though right at the start, he could show, I get the right answers. I get answers that agree with experiment, more of a sort of a physical science idea. Um, it took a while to, to even start to have these ideas be acceptable. But the objections still kept cropping up. We seem to be able to, to uh, get contradictions from this theory. Um, and what that did is it initiated a century-long upheaval in the foundations of mathematics. And people realized the problem was not with Fourier's ideas, it was with the basics, ide basics of calculus and the very loose, unrigorous way in which people had understood them. So people like uh, Cauchy and Weierstrass, uh, Dedekind, many, many people in the mid-19th century started to revamp mathematics in a much more rigorous way, especially calculus. Um, and that led to the modern um, notion of mathematics. Well, in pr and in particular, it led Cantor to study a particular question about how do you represent functions as sums of sine waves, and in particular, is that representation unique? And what it led him to was he started considering certain sets of real numbers, rather like the Cantor set, that was one of the ways, he, one of the things he was led to, 
Um, and it led him to an infinite process, very much like what I was giving you with our huge numbers process, where he'd create one set, and then he'd do a process, and he would create a new set out of the old set, and then a new set out of the old set, and so on. And then he also realized there was another way to sort of break out of that loop and create a set out of all of those at once. Just like we created our list of sort of garden variety, hugely growing functions, and then we did the diagonal uh, process to create yet a new one that, that started the process all over again. And Cantor realized, what I've got here is a notion of 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 infinity, and then infinity plus 1, and then infinity plus 2, and infinity plus infinity. I, I need to make sense of this. I need to describe it. And he realized uh, that this was the start of something amazing. So it's not really just Cantor, again, um, that was the leg that has this legacy. He was a big part of it. But these people starting with Fourier and, of course, Cantor and people like Riemann, I, f I forgot to mention Cauchy and Dedekind and um, lots of people, and Hilbert was a big figure. He kind of started, came along a little bit late in the process, but sort of tried to tie it up and said, uh, I think we can revamp the foundations. And he was big in saying we should really make this much more abstract, much more axiomatic. We can achieve a level of rigor that was really would have been amazing to the Greeks. They loved to think they were rigorous, but if you actually tear apart Euclid's axioms, they're not rigorous. They're not clear and, def and definite. And he actually uses things in his proofs that he doesn't assume, um, that he just thought were obvious. Well, modern rigor is an amazing standard of rigor. The beauty of that is it's not just rigor for its own sake. Rigor leads to generality. If you know exactly what you're doing and when it's true and when it's not true, you can generalize much, much easier. And that's been an immense power. Okay, So people like the Greeks and Newton, who you know, helped invent calculus, they would have been amazed um, by this level of rigor. They might, might have had a hard time understanding it as well. Um, in the process, um, when you really redo mathematics on that fundament, fundamental level, Hilbert had the idea that it would all be sort of completely mechanized, which is a kind of a wonderful idea, but also kind of dep depressing if you think about it. And Gödel came along in the 1930s and said, no, if you try to mechanize it, you will, you'll show that there are things that are not provable, that are not solvable. Um, and it's, it's really like a breath of fresh air, although it was shocking and, and uh, I think disappointing at the time, especially to Hilbert. So let me close with one more uh, application of something that's essentially the diagonalization trick. Um, and it's called Russell's paradox. And this was one of the uh, initial paradoxes from uh, you know, around, the around 1900 that made people very suspicious of set theory at the start, but really eventually just made people realize you had to be very careful about what you meant um, and never make any assumptions that you can't justify. So here's the, here's the not um, formal version, and I'll end with the formal version. You end with you imagine a library with all the world's books, and in particular, uh, some of those books are catalogs that all they do is list other books. That's all they do. It's just list of books. Okay. Now it's perfectly legal for a catalog to list itself, because after all, a catalog is a book, and so a catalog can list itself uh, in in its own catalog. But let's not make any requirement that any particular catalog uh, be complete. Okay. So a lot of books, some of them are catalogs, and it's legal for a catalog to list itself. Okay. Now let's imagine a very particular catalog. It's the catalog of books. It lists the books, it looks the, sorry, it lists the catalogs that do not list themselves. Some catalogs will list themselves, some catalogs will not. Let's look at the catalog that lists precisely the catalogs that do not list themselves. Now remember, the assumption was this is a library with all the world's books all the books. Big library, obviously. Okay, it's a big assumption. Um, but so this catalog seems like should be in there. The catalog that lists the catalogs that do not list themselves. Now notice sort of the analogous analogy to the diagonalization idea. The idea that you're treating a catalog as something that is, as a book, but also as something that can be an entry in a book. So you're treating the same object in two different ways. Kind of like in the diagonalization argument before, we were list, looking at the labels as labels of things on a list or labels of lists. And we're doing the negation part. It's the catalogs that do not list themselves. So there is this formal uh, similarity. Now, let's see what's interesting about this catalog. Well, it turns out it's very interesting. Let's suppose that this catalog does list itself, because we want to actually ask, oh, what about this catalog that we've, we've looked at, the one that lists the li catalogs that do not list themselves? Does it list itself, yes or no? Well, let's suppose that it does list itself. 
But wait, then it can't list itself because that kind of catalog doesn't belong in this catalog. Remember, the catalog, this thing was supposed to be the catalog of, of catalogs that do not list themselves. So if it does list itself, then it can't. Okay, well, wait a minute. Okay, so suppose maybe it's just that the catalog doesn't list itself. But wait a minute. If the catalog doesn't list itself, then it really should list itself because, hey, that's exactly the kind of catalog that this catalog is supposed to include. It's, there's, there's a paradox here, okay? You can't get out of it. It's also very similar um, to the, the liar paradox. That somebody says, I, all my statements are lies. This is something that you just cannot resolve. The answer to it is not that this is an all nonsense. It's that we assumed that this library had all possible books, including all possible catalogs in it. That must have been the assumption that was at fault. And so, in fact, you can't have the catalog or the, the library with all possible books. The formal, formal version of this, it's, this is called Russell's Paradox, as I've said, uh, Bertrand Russell, the famous philosopher. It's suppose I have the U, the universe, be the set of all sets. We, we're interested in set theory. We think everything should be a set. Okay, so let's look at the set of all sets. Okay, seems like an okay notion. You can say the words. But then you look at the set, let S be the set of all sets in that universe that are not elements of themselves. And then you ask, is S an element of itself? Well, if it is, then by definition, wait a minute, it's supposed to be all the sets that aren't elements, not elements of themselves. So it's not. But wait, if it's not an element of itself, okay, then, oh, that's exactly what's supposed to put it in S, then it is an element of itself very formal and I think the catalog book analogy most people feel like that's uh, makes it a little bit more understandable is this a paradox no it just shows that this idea let you this assumption let you be the set of all sets the universe doesn't exist you can't have a universe so some things that you can some words that you can say you can show are going to be totally fundamentally inconsistent with the basic ideas of set theory um, so I wanted to close with that because it's a famous example and um, it, it, it shows you, it, it's the start of a road towards really carefully understanding what you can and can't do with set theory and infinities. Um, and it's also just a, the absolute purest distilled form of the diagonal argument.